Here's an example of doing inference for linear regression. Uh, this will be part one. I think I'll break it up into two or three parts. It's based on number 26 from the last chapter of Bach, Bellman, and DeVoe. I did modify this in case you're trying to just cheat on your homework. It's not going to work. Um, it's about crawling age. Does the temperature uh, at when a baby's around six months old, which is about when they start to crawl, does that affect the age at which they first crawl? So we collect data for a bunch of boys and girls, 196 boys, 194 girls, and we look at the birth month and the temperature when they're six months old, average temperature, and the average crawling age. So notice we're not reporting um, all, you know, close to 400, like 390 data points, just 12 different data points because we've averaged all the January babies in terms of temperature and crawling age. That's, and that's going to be pretty relevant, but it does make for a, ma a manageable data set. Okay. And the question is, is there an association between these two variables? Well, if this were the entire data set, we would know how to do that from way back in chapter 8. But remember, this is just a sample that's supposed to be hopefully representative of all the babies, let's say all the babies in the United States maybe. And we'd like to make some sort of inference about all those babies. That's the new part. Okay, so first of all, um, a preliminary question. What would change if individual babies' data were reported instead of averages? If we did have that whole 390-point data set, um, probably that would be better, right? Well, this and it is indeed because um, there would be more scatter and variation in the data than what we're going to see in the, in the graphs that I'm going to show you. And whatever association we get would tend to look less strong. Or another way to say it is, we're, it's, it turns out we're going to find an association here. And any association we may find is going to be a bit misleadingly strong, probably, because we're suppressing that natural scatter by averaging for, for, uh, for each month. So that's a very important um, warning right at the start about any kind of results we would get out of this. We've made a more manageable data set, but we're suppressing some actual variation. So it's pretty dangerous. Anyway, we're going to proceed because we want to have a data set that we can type into the calculator. OK, so here's the heart, the two questions that are hard of all this. Is there evidence of an association between temperature and crawling age? We want to test a hypothesis. We want to practice the idea of testing hypothesis for, um, in particular, the slope of a regression line. And we want to create and interpret a confidence interval for the slope of the true relationship. The true relationship is the mysterious quantity, which is if I graphed every single baby on a scatter plot and I put a regression line on that scatter plot, that's a, the ideal slope we'd like to get. We can't get it but we could get a confidence interval for it if the conditions are satisfied. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, let's look at the actual calculation. Um, look at the calculation, the hypothesis test. Before we do the steps, I'm going to go with the steps on page 639. Let's think about the random randomization condition in context. Remember, the randomization condition, it's a way to try to guarantee the independence assumption, which is crucial for the mathematics to work. Um, okay, well, what happened with this sample? They didn't give us a lot of data or a lot of um, methodolo methodological information. But we're going to hope that these are a representative sample of babies, um, that they're not completely biased, and that they're independent of each other. They're not, say, all siblings. Pretty unlikely that all 390 of them are going to be siblings or um, all live in the same apartment complex or something like that. So we are trusting that this is a something like a decent representative sample with not without a lot of um, dependence between the babies. Okay. Um, now we're going to look at what the data says, if there's any red flags in the data. So let's make a scatter plot. We know how to do that. Um, check the straight enough condition in a kind of a um, loose way by just looking at it visually. Okay, not, not obviously curved. Seems straight, and it looks like a negative association right off the bat. And then we're just going to try to make that more precise, basically. Um, let's fit the regression line. That's stat calc 8. Um, and I'll, I'll notice this is going to be a little different from the calculator example they have in the book because there they just dive right into the inference and the inference, um, the t-test for regression that the calculator does, does this for you automatically. But I want to highlight the part we already kind of know, the regression analysis from StatCalc 8 first, the LINREG stuff, and then we'll do the, inf uh, the regression uh, or the, uh, the inference. So this is going to be a little less efficient than what you'd really do in practice, but it's good to, to warm up. So. Uh, this is what we, the screen we look at, the one thing I want to remind people of is that um, you put in whatever variable you want here, like y1 is a good one, so that it'll plot the line. Okay, so here's the regression line, here's the coefficients of the regression line, it gives us an r squared. The r squared, of course, is a very interesting thing to look at. 
0.685, that's pretty good. So at least for this particular sample, with some of the, a lot of the possible scatter reduced, uh, we're getting a pretty decent R squared. But that is kind of fake, um, that it's, so, it's such a good R squared. But um, the, we can re write this out in terms of more meaningful variables by saying the predicted crawling age based on this sample is 36 weeks minus about 0 0.08 times the temperature. So for every increase of one degree Fahrenheit in the temperature, we get about 0 0.08 weeks earlier uh, crawling age. Not dramatic, but meaningful, probably. Okay, and that's what we're really trying to figure out. Remember, these are the Bs, not the betas. The Bs are what's coming from the sample. They're the best possible slope and intercept for a line that fit this data. They're not the, the uh, coefficients, the slope and intercept of the line that would fit the population data, which we're never going to have direct access to. Okay, continuing with the checks to make sure everything is making sense, make a scatter plot of the residuals. I'll always look at that residual graph. Okay, so there's the residuals. Um, check for a bunch of things. Is there any obvious pattern that we see right away? That's one way to sort of see secret lack of independence. Mm, I don't see anything. Check for any kind of bend. Nothing terribly obvious. Okay, that checks the straight enough condition in a little more precise way. Check for thickening and thinning. That's something we didn't pay too much attention to before, but it's really crucial here. They talk about in the book that the variances shouldn't depend on what the value of your explanatory variable is. Okay, So it shouldn't be a lot thicker over here and thinner over here. The reason for that is that it would just make the math wrong. There's this, uh, there's this underlying assumption that the variances are equal to make the simple version of the math that's being done by the calculator correct. Okay looks pretty good here. looks like the variability doesn't drastically change. Hard to tell with 12 data points, but it's, it's not too bad. Check for any outliers, and remember things like leverage, the way outliers work in regression. Here, um, I haven't highlighted that, um, so we'll, maybe we'll do another example where we deal with outliers. Okay, if time is involved, and isn't the explanatory variable already, um, so that you've already sort of got a plot of it, you want to plot the residuals against time to check for patterns. So here's what I did. I put in the month number, just 1 through 12, as another list. And then I plotted resid versus month, not L1 or L2. And see if there's any obvious pattern. Well, you know, there's, it seems like it's kind of going up a bit. So this would be a little bit of a red flag here, that maybe for some reason the residuals are kind of drifting. That's maybe indicating that there's some sort of um, curving to it. When you when you when we look at the plot that has when we look at the plot versus time, okay. So this would be a little bit of a concern, but it's not drastic, and so I don't think it's something that's a showstopper. And once again, the once again, um, this is something that we didn't do with regression, but this is combining the t-test stuff. Look at the nearly normal condition. You can look at the histogram of the residuals, just just the residuals, not plotted against some other variable right now, but just the list of those residuals. Um, remember to get resid in uh, as a variable. You just you can go list names resid instead of doing the alpha. You could do alpha r e s i d as well. This is not the most wonderfully symmetric plot, but it doesn't look horrible. Okay, remember it's, we're looking for unimodal and symmetric. I, I would would say it's not absolutely horrible. With twelve data points, it's never going to look perfect. Okay, so again, maybe a slight concern, not a showstopper. The normal probability plot. We hadn't really done that too much um, with the t-test before, but it was always an option. And um, I want to do it here to remind you. The mechanics of that, remember, if you go to the stat plot, and then it's this last one here. And once you select that one, it'll say data list, data access. And um, just put in resid again with the list names resid thing. And um, just leave the data access as x. And remember what we're looking for is that normal probability plot the straighter it is, the closer to normal it is. That looks pretty good. It's a little bit weird that this is kind of on a certain straight line, and then there's kind of a, a stutter, and this maybe is kind of on a different straight line. So it's not really completely straight. It's almost suggesting that there's kind of maybe a, a bimodality or some sort of two groups to it. But it's not ridiculously bad. Again, not perfect, not horrible. OK, so uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk about the doing the mechanics of the regression slope t-test after a brief interlude about why we're doing this and what's the meaning of it. But that's a good place to stop right now.